she's nice on TV and she's fun and she's loving and she has some political views, you know, uh, and, and you can decide if, if you agree with them or if you don't or if they're even relevant in your mind, you know, who cares what I think. But when people ask, I say it. And sometimes it gets me in trouble. Welcome to On Brand with Donnie Deutsch, and I am Donnie Deutsch, and this is the podcast dedicated to a simple premise that everybody and everything, every institution, every religion, every politician is a brand today. If you've got a Facebook page, you are a brand. The brand is a set of values. And we do two things on the show. Um, we have a big interview uh, with an iconic brand in themselves, and today we've got Rosie O'Donnell. She's got a lot to say. Uh, fascinating, fascinating interview. And we also do our brands of the week. We kind of talk about which brands or which companies, which products, which people are up or down, who's driving the zeitgeist. And I kind of give it a thumbs up, thumbs down to the brands of the week. So let's get right into our brands of the week. First brand, big brand up for streaming services. That's right. At the Emmys the other night, the streaming services for the first time kind of just cleaned up Netflix, The Crown, The Queen's Gambit, combined with Apple TV's Ted Lasso. They swept the top uh, series honors at the Emmys Awards. It's the streaming. It cemented their rise to prominence. Uh, it's the first time that they won all the categories and this is it. I mean, we shouldn't even say streaming TV anymore. Streaming is TV. Uh, and big thumbs up to Jason Sudeikis, uh, brand up, obviously Ted Lasso, big winner. Um, but it just, it really solidifies just that streaming is the thing. I don't think we need the award shows to tell us that, but that's where the great action is. That's where the great dramas are. That's where the great comedies are. And if your program on broadcast TV, it's not even fair because you can't do so many things creatively that you can do. And Apple and Netflix have unlimited budgets. So streaming, uh, long live streaming, it is the king. Um, brand down for Time Magazine's most 100 most influential people. I mean, it's just interesting when you go through the list and how they decide on things that you put so many like, Kate Winslet on there, who's a nice actress. I'm not quite sure where she's influenced the world, but you don't put somebody like, I don't know, Chuck Schumer, I think maybe he's influencing the world, or Mitch McConnell. Right? I, I, it's just a weird thing, the word influential. Um, I, I don't mean to signal out Kate Winslet, but I find so many people on that list and I go, these are the hundred most influential. I shouldn't Vladimir Putin be on there. I mean, he's, he's despicable, but basically is a little more influential than some of these other people. So I think you should call it people who are of, you know, having cultural moments or things like that, but to call them the world's most hundred influential people and, and, uh, Scott Johansson, I don't know if I'm making my list of a hundred, I don't know if those people are on there that they're wonderful actresses, but I'm not quite sure what they're influencing. Uh, brand up for Nike. Um, Nike won, uh, you have to see this and I want you to look it up. It's called, you can't stop us. It won the Emmy of the year for the best commercial, um, it's a split screen ad narrated by Megan Raponi. It's required more a thousand hours of, they put these seamless visual pictures of disparate sport events together. I'm not going to describe it. I just want you to, to look up, uh, you can't stop us ad by Nike. And I wanted to sing it up because to me, I've spent my entire, not my entire career. I've spent a lot of my career in advertising and all my career talking about brands and advertising. If you said to me, who is the best branding company of all time, I would say Nike uh, consistently, uh, just starting with their basic premise of uh, just do it, owning empowerment. They've been able to just still stay a kind of renegade brand while being the ultimate mass brand at the same time. And that's almost impossible to do. So <laughs> continued uh, thumbs up to Nike, their advertising agency, Widen and Kennedy. They probably use others now, but have done always a spectacular job. Um, big brand down for Nicki Minaj. Um, she tweeted inaccurate information about COVID. She tweeted that a friend of her cousins in, in I think it was in Trinidad or somewhere, developed swollen testicles and impotence after getting vaccinated for COVID-19. Um, just not true, false. And any of these celebrities that are going out of their way uh, to keep people from getting vaccinated, particularly in, in areas that are, are so troubled in areas of people of color and you're Nicki Minaj and you're tweeting this fucking shit out there. Shame on you, brand down. Equally for Cole Beasley, uh, Cole Beasley, uh, the wide receiver for the Bills. You know, basically the Bills are the, one of the four NFL teams that basically said you have to be vaccinated to go to stadiums, and I think all stadiums should do it. Uh, some of the fans said, well, if we can't be vaccinated, we're going to travel to other stadiums to see our teams play. And basically, um, Beasley and another guy named Ferguson said they'll buy tickets of unvaccinated fans who travel to see them play. They're encouraging 
we so believe in you being unvaccinated that we're going to buy you tickets to come to our traveling games. And come on, guys, what the fuck? I mean, it's just keeping us safe. It's just, and I, I, the whole vaccine thing is the most inane discussion because all of us adults have grown up our entire life getting mandated vaccines. You couldn't go to school unless you, for vaccines for the measles and mumps and smallpox. I, it, it's ludicrous. So big brand down to Cole Beasley. Huge brand down for AOC, uh, Alexandria or Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, the Met Gala, which was last week, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, it's this big hoo-ha in New York City where all the you know, biggest celebrities and stars come out. It's it's Vogue's thing. And and it's the most decadent, and I'm using that. I'm not even saying the negative, negative sense word. It's, it's the ultimate of the most decadent celebration of elitism and wealth and status and everything that uh, AOC kind of flaunts against. And what does she do? She shows up on the red carpet in a white gown that says tax the rich. And of course, yes, she's making a statement and it's, but it's like, what the fuck are you doing there? And then you're drinking the champagne and eating the caviar and getting your picture taken on the red carpet is the ultimate act of hypocrisy. I, I, I just wanted to puke when I saw it. And it's like, on the one hand, she crusades about being the activist for the every person, yet indulges herself, whether it's a cover of Vanity Fair or showing up the Met Gala, uh, and uh, yes, with the tax the rich thing. But then it, 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 it's, it was just nauseating to me. And to me, she's the ultimate opportunist, the ultimate person that will be cashing in on her celebrity uh, all the way to the bank. Um, big brand up for Al Franken, a former guest on the show, a former uh, uh, interview, one of my favorite interviews. He's keeping his options open about a run again, and he should run. Um, one of the great examples of the Democrats eating their own um, ludicrous uh, that he was forced to resign, and he was an important voice, and I hope he does come back, and I think he would win in a landslide. I'm not quite sure who the senators are from Minnesota, but we could certainly use a little Al Franken back. Um, <coughs> brand down for Texas Governor Greg Abbott. I think this is fascinating. And I've said it all along. All of these stances that these politicians are making about anti-vaxxing and things like that, beyond from a humanity point of view and a safety point of view, are they off kilter? I've always thought from a political point of view, it's not where the majority is. And no surprise, basically he's underwater in a new approval poll. Um, 45% of Texans approve of, of Abbott's appointments, 54 disapprove. So he's by the Dallas, this is Dallas Morning News, he's 9% underwater. And what's interesting was before COVID, his approval rating was 59%. So he's dropped 14%. So I don't even understand from a political point of view what the hell these guys are doing. It's just bad politics. So I, th this is stunning. Greg Abbott, one of the one of the poster children for anti-vax and this far-right wignut movement, it's hurting him in the polls. So what are you doing, dude? Um, Jay Leno, brand up. Uh, he's coming back. He's, he's with a new You Bet Your Life revival. Now, anybody who's over the age of... 50, 60, uh, can even, not that You Bet Your Life was on before us, but that was Groucho Marx's game show, one of the first kind of breakout game shows. And Jay Leno is bringing it back in a syndicated show being distributed by Fox. And Jay Leno, one of the real nice guys. I did his show a few times and I'm glad he's back in the culture. Um, brand up for remote work revolution, which I am against. So I'm just, I'm not saying I'm give brand up for remote work. It's just, Here's a study that says one in six will quit their jobs if they can't continue working from home. So we've spoiled people. They want to work from home, duh. And here's what's interesting. Uh, an flex job survey of more than 4,600 people finds 58% of people say they want a fully remote job. Well, of course they do. They want to sit in their pajamas. 39% uh, prefer a hybrid job. And just 3% of respondents want to return to office full-time after the pandemic. Um you know, I, I I just think that that's a problem. I, I think that it's uh, work is not as productive. I think young people suffer the most. There's there's less training. There's less collaboration. Uh, as somebody who ran a company and knows so much about, by the, by the way, the same. I remember putting all the time into designing space because you wanted people to interact a certain way and connect a certain way, and particularly creative businesses are all about human connectivity and. I just, if I was still running my company today, people would be required to come back to work. It's that simple. And it may, it may not be, or certainly a hybrid. You know, you, you give one of people one day a week off to work from home with certain, a little bit of a flex schedule, but this work from home stuff, uh, one in six will quit their job if they can't continue working from home. Well, God bless. Um, Tom Brady, brand up. I, he shows up on the show a lot. Um, 
He says he believes he can he can play until he's 50. I don't find it so difficult. And, you know, coming off this past week of him throwing five touchdown passes, uh, the guy at 40, is he 45 or 46? I'm not sure. The guy, I think 45. The guy looks better than ever. And we've got to look into that. There's something, I mean, he's got his TB12 and his workout and his nutrition, but we've got to dissect, we've got to do a, a live, di- not a real dissection of Tom Brady. Somebody's got to figure out what this guy is doing because I remember watching George Blanda play in, in for the Oakland Raiders in, in his mid forties. He was like an old man. He looked like an old man playing, but this guy looks better than the young guys. We, we got it. We got to use him and figure out what the hell is going on with Tom Brady. But the guy continues to amaze me. Uh, brand up for NBA's Milwaukee Bucks owned by a friend of mine, Mark Lazary. They have a new voice. It's the first uh, woman play-by-play announcer. Um, Lisa Byington is the new lead announcer for the Bucks television, local Bucks television broadcasts. And there you go. If you would have told me as a kid that I'd be listening to women do play-by-play basketball, I'd say no way. Not that I would be against it, but it was just not something that was in my purview. And um, here we go. Got to love it. Uh, NBA's Milwaukee Bucks, the first woman play-by-play announcer. Bud Light, brand up. The car barrier has been broken by Bud Light. Anheuser-Busch has announced the launch of Bud Light Next, the company's first ever zero-car beer, a beer with zero carbs. There's 30 fewer calories than the same amount of alcohol by volume compared to Bud Light. Um, It's got six grams of carbs in a 12-ounce serving. This has got no carbs. Uh, Amazing. You know, the world keeps getting places, which I don't understand. Here's what I know. This is, I'm just going to divert first. Di- divert, diverse, divert, um, digress. Um, why can't they make, like, they can make beer with no carbs. Why can't they make, like, French fries with no carbs and things? And we're putting, you, you can pick up your phone and talk to somebody from China and, and see their face. Yeah, we still can't make really great food that has no calories in it. Can we figure this out? Uh, brand up for vinyl records. There's an American vinyl bridge. Of course, for young people don't even know what vinyls are. Those are those records. They're the actual records you put on the turntable with, uh, you put the needle in it. And it's making a surge coming back. It's it's on the rise. Uh, look, still the overwhelming majority of music is listened to the digital way. But as some of you grew up with it, there is something that does happen. You There's an interactivity to the music or putting it on a record. It seems so ancient right now, but that you're even a little bit more part of the experience. I know it's hard to explain, but if somebody has never listened to a record, a vinyl record, go try it. It's something interesting. It's something pretty special. Um, KFC, brand up, meatless chicken. It's working to make vegan chicken perfect, and it's going to hit hopefully all all 4,000 stores soon. So chicken with no chicken in it. There you go, plant-based. What's the world coming to? And finally, Taco Bell, brand up, subscription tacos. Here you go. It's called Taco Lover's Pass, which lets you get exactly one taco every single day for 30 days with a subscription that costs five to 10 bucks. They're trialing it in, seven, in 17 locations. Think about that. You get a taco a day, and it costs somewhere between five and 10 bucks, so you're going to save so much money, and taco a day keeps the doctor away. Subscription for tacos. It's a brave new world. And those are our brands of the week. And let's get to our interview with uh, Rosie O'Donnell. Rosie, uh, just a, a, a really fresh voice, obviously, has been a, a iconic figure on television for years, a political voice. Uh, she's got a lot to say. Let's get to our interview with Rosie O'Donnell. Okay. How many subscriptions to different things do you have a month? Uh, before you answer, I'm going to answer for you. You probably don't know. And that's why you need Truebill. Um, I know I don't even know the different subscriptions I signed up for. And here's this. It's a new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. On average, people are saving thousands a year with Truebill. See all your subscriptions in one place, keep the ones you want, cancel the ones you don't, right from the app. I mean, this is just a very cool thing. All on one app, you see all your subscriptions, you get to clean them up. Here's the ones I want, here's the ones I don't want, as opposed to this kind of just like whole space out there, your subscriptions. And your ter- Truebill concierge is, is there. You need them to cancel unwanted subscriptions so you don't have to. There's no talking to humans, no difficult conversations. Truebill has over 2 million users Help them save over $100 million. I use it. Um, I just let's, I'm going to give you a quote from another user, Matthew B., who says, in a matter of seconds, I saved 660 bucks for the year on my direct TV bill, saved 120 bucks for the year on my Sirius XM bill, saved 840 years on car insurance. Guys, this is a smart thing. Just try it out. Go to Truebill. Start canceling your unused subscriptions on truebills.com slash onbrand. 
That's truebill.com slash on brand. Go right now. It could save you hundreds a year. Truebill.com slash on brand. I want to talk to you about trust and will. Look, a lot of you are just starting out, buying a home, having babies, building your wealth. Be sure to add securing your family's future to your to-do list by establishing a will or trust at will or trustandwill.com. That's trustandwill.com. At trustandwill.com, setting up an estate plan is simple, convenient, and secure. No matter what stage in life you are, you need to do this, and Trust and Will makes it simple. For as little as 39 bucks, you can nominate guardians for your children, determine who gets your stuff, and plan for future medical care, all from the comfort of your home. Look, hiring a traditional estate attorney can cost thousands, and using a one-size-fits-all template is not nearly specialized enough. Trust and Will documents are designed by estate planning experts and customized for the state you live in. And you have live customer support seven days a week. The trustandwill.com's team is available to answer any questions you have while setting up your plan. Uh, I'm telling you, trust and will is a really, really smart thing. Everybody should look at it. Just look into it. You need to set this up and you don't need to hire thousands of dollars and go to attorneys. Trust and will will do it for you. It's the most trusted name in online estate planning. It's the category leader on Trustpilot. Gain peace of mind at trustandwill.com slash Donnie. Then get 10% off free shipping of your customized legal documents. Don't wait. Go right now. This is really important. No matter where you are in your life, you need this. Get 10% off plus free shipping at trustandwill.com slash Donnie. Trustandwill.com slash Donnie. This is uh, my next, not my next, I don't know, next. This is my first guest, my only guest on the show today. Uh, (laughs) She's got, I I could go on for 20 minutes with her introduction. I've been a fan for years. And and Rosie O'Donnell is, of course, uh, she's kind of a part of our culture. Uh, many, many, many chapters to her story, a stand-up comedian, a talk show host, a view co-host, uh, actress, philanthropist, humanitarian, um, author, um, and just kind of an important voice in our culture. And I'm thrilled that she's here on our brand. Thanks for, thanks for doing this, Rosie. My pleasure, Donnie. How are you? I'm good. How are you? How are you feeling? I know you, you had a, a kind of a funky pandemic. Uh, you, yeah, you- I had a little depression there going on and I was like, you know, I got to get into the sun. And I, I had a series that I just got picked up for um, on Showtime called American Gigolo based on the based movie, on the movie? From when, when oh, we wow. were kids. Right. right. Now okay. it's tw- it's 20 years later and he's found not to be the man who did it. OK. And so he gets let out and I'm a cop and I try to convince him to um, figure out who set him up and why. So that's the premise of and, and we did the pilot and. And it was out here and I had to leave her for a long period of time, my eight-year-old daughter. And um, so I said, you know, let's go out there and try third grade out in L.A. Right. And then in January, mommy will start to work and we'll see if we like it. And if we like it, we'll stay here. And if we don't, you know, we'll figure it out. You have talked a lot. I did a lot of research for this, obviously. And you, you just talked a lot about your projects over the years and the conflict with your kids. you got three daughters, two sons, and uh, one little one at home. Your next youngest is, what, 18 or? Uh, yes, right? yeah. 18. So, She's at college. Yeah, but you, you've you had kind of the struggles that so many women have had over the years that us, us stupid guys don't really have to deal with, which, which is kind of the, you know, being pulled and all that comes with that. And it's just kind of been a little bit of an, a theme for kind of your professional, personal life. Yeah. Cause you know, when I left my show, it was because my mom had died at 40 and at 39, she never reached 40. So I was about to reach 40 and, uh, I wanted to be home with my kids to do all those things my mother never got to do whether it's, you know, picking them up at school or yeah. going to their sports games, all of those little things that, you know, never take precedence when you're filming a TV show or, you know, you're in the midst of that kind of fame cycle that makes every outing about you and, and not about them. And, you know, the time for kids to sort of be narcissists are, are, is now, yeah, right? Yeah. When, when, when they're little and they can think that, you know, the world is, is all about them. You know, and it's hard to do that when everyone's saying, can I have your autograph or can I have your picture? Yeah. Little kids get a distorted view of who's important and why, you know. So I always wrestled with that, starting with the big success of my uh, TV show. It was sort of instantly successful overnight and it sort of changed everything in our life very quickly, you know. You, your TV show, it's it's so interesting that your TV show in certain ways is a, 
precursor to so many shows that kind of came afterwards in, in kind of two ways. On the one hand, you know, it was this very kind of safe, fun, you were the queen of nice, Newsweek dubbed you, and it was this kind of place where uh, misfits could come and, you know, you, you know, and it, it, and it was joyous and you were a fan. And then also some of the things you're most known for was was the stuff with Tom Selleck and some of the kind of all of a sudden political stuff would pop up. And it's been a little bit, oh, I think, symbolic of, I'm going to ask you about your brand, your brand, these two sides to it, this kind of right. loving champion of the underdog, nice, you know, you know, you're, you're my best friend. Obviously, you always played a lot of best friends in movies and things like that. But on the other hand, this kind of provocateur and very kind of political character and those kind of two rosies have existed together. Yeah, and it's funny that now that I'm going to be 60, I am finally at a point where I can merge those all together into one entity. You know, uh, people, when I, I remember, Donnie, when I got my, uh, my talk show was a big hit, but I still had a year in my contract in Caesar's Palace. So I went to Caesar's Palace like three or six months after my show launched, and there were little old ladies in the front, and I started doing my stand-up, and they were... A gog. Like, who is they this? Were, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is not the Like, what yeah. is she doing? This is not the girl we see on TV. So it really ruined my ability to do stand-up because that is a provocative art form. And that's how I sort of came up in the world, was doing that. And uh, it was sort of cut off for me for those six years that I did the show. It was like I couldn't, at that time, merge the two, you know? It was hard to imagine being able to be open about my life. And now here it is 20 years later, Ellen's been doing the show for 20 years since I stopped. And um, she's able to do that. The times have changed. The environment has changed. The access to um, different kind of ways to be in the world is available to all through the internet. You know, so I don't know. I think it's it's a time now for all of those things to come in one. It always was one person, but people found it hard to hold two opposing thoughts in their head at the same time, <laughs> yes, right? Yes, we we so it's like you, Rosie O'Donnell is yeah. right. She's nice on TV and she's fun and she's loving and she has some political views, you know. Uh, and, and you can decide if if you agree with them or if you don't or if they're even relevant in your mind, you know. Who cares what I think? But when people ask, I say it, and sometimes it gets me in trouble. So, was there a moment? You know, you, you your fame, your big fame came as you said, kind of quickly. You know, you were obviously well known, and you know, but all of a sudden the show and its show exploded very, very, very fast, and it was right. it was it was a real destination and and whatnot. Do you at that moment kind of say to yourself, "Hmm, I have maybe a bigger job here to do than just you know interview the next celebrity or this and that"? That I have. Because you, you do have so many things that are near and dear heart to you, and you have been an advocate in, in so many different ways. Does that just naturally happen? Does that evolve? Was there a moment where you said, oh, wait a second, I, I, can, I can do some shit with this stuff beyond just get ratings and entertain people? Yeah, you know, I think I, it did happen. That did happen for me. And I, I'm much more of a sprinter than a marathon runner. Like when I think of Oprah doing what, 30 years did she do? Yeah. Or, you and know, a- and, Ellen and now and 20 years. Ellen, yeah. right. I mean, 20 years, that's a long chunk of time. And I have tremendous respect for people who are able to keep the ball in the air for that long. I couldn't do it. I was, you know, first of all, very exhausted. And I was done with doing that art form. And I felt like I had done everything I wanted to do. And I was on to a new chapter in my life, which was focusing more on my parenting and, and uh, doing documentary films with Sheila Nevins over at HBO and um, having my, my own charity and, and the school in the city that I run that I've been doing for 25 years. And um, they're making a documentary on it, which I think will be wonderful to get to see the success of the children that we've had graduate through there. But um, all of those pieces have equally demanded a voice, you know, for me. And I couldn't just do one thing for the rest of my life. I knew I had to have some freedom to move around creatively and artistically and, and to allow myself to be done. Because the kind of life, you know, it's hard when you have children to have the kind of schedule that I did. It was really, really hard. And... I didn't like missing the day that you bring in the cupcakes to their school, you know, 
I don't, I didn't like missing the little things. And, and then when my kids all, you know, my, my son was seven when I left the show. And um, I remember my goal for the first year was just picking him up from school every day. You know, I had having my, having my own driver for the last six years, you know, that was my only goal was to spend a year and getting him from school every day. You, you talked a lot how that, that particular thing, picking up your kids from school, it's a very emotional yeah. thing. Yeah. That you, you would, I, I mean, because of your childhood and you losing your mom and uh, that it, you almost had this kind of anxiety about, I, I can't get there too early. I can't get there too late. I just got to get there exactly. right. And you, and you, you would look at your clock at 2.20 and go, I, I, you know, that how something that for somebody like you who juggles so much and has such a big platform, something that to everyday people is the most simple and banal of tasks for you took on this very kind of Herculean task for you. Yeah. It's so interesting. I have with one Parker, when I was picking up Parker, which was, you know, 25 years ago, he, um, I would get there a half an hour early so I could park in the one spot that was easy to get out of. So I wouldn't be caught in the chaos of the, all the cars in the line. And now with Dakota, who's eight, who hopefully is my last child, um, I uh, get there early to drop her off and I get there early to pick her up. So she sometimes doesn't like that because she has to leave the classroom early Yeah. if I'm too early. So she tries to tell me, be number three or number four. <laughs> don't be number one Isn't or amazing? number Kids two. Just, they just want to be, they don't want to stand out in any way. They just- Exactly. They okay, look. As particularly as we age, but any age, you know, you, fatigue can't be solved by caffeine and things like that. There's a new way to start your day. Super Beats Heart Chews. They're, it's, it's by human. They're called Super Beats Heart Chews. They're a tasty treat that give you the energy you need and they're good for you. No more afternoon coffees, energy drinks, and can, or candy for a quick pick-me-up. Add two delicious plant-based Super Beats Heart Chews to your morning routine and promote heart-healthy energy for your day without a caffeine crash. The company is human. The, the product is Super Beats Heart Chews. Because Super Beats Heart Chews are unique. They're clinically researched. They're from grape seed extracts. They promote heart healthy energy and normal blood pressure as part of your healthy lifestyle. It's it, they're really good. I've tried these things. It's good energy. It's healthy. The grape seed extract used in Super Beats Heart Chews has been clinically shown to be two times as effective at supporting normal blood pressure as healthy lifestyle alone. Join over one million customers. Get free shipping and returns. A ninety day money back guarantee. And right now you can get a free thirty day supply. Free thirty day supply with your first purchase of superbeats.com slash Donnie. That's S-U-P-E-R-B-E-E-T-S dot com slash Donnie. Do more for your heart. Treat yourself with Super Beats Heart Shoes. Okay, message to small business owners, startups, freelancers, entrepreneurs, any small business guys. You know the number one way to to avoid unfair bank fees? Close your account and open up a new Novo free business banking account. That's N-O-V-O. Novo is the number one banking business app, business banking app, because it's built from the ground up to be powerfully simple and free business banking that Money Magazine called the best business checking account of 2021. There are no minimum balances, no transaction limits, no hidden fees. Sign up free for under 10 minutes at banknovo, that's B-A-N-K-N-O-V-O.com slash on brand. Then they'll mail you a Novo debit card and you get free ATM use. Novo makes banking easy and secure. You can manage your account. Novo's customizable web, Android, and iOS app, built-in profit, first accounting and voicing. Plus, you can tag each transaction, upload receipts. Uh, This is small. I'm telling you guys, if you're a small business, you want to avoid banking fees, you want it all in one place, Novo seamlessly integrates with most leading business tools and services like Stripe, Shopify, QuickBooks, and more for free. Plus, Novo offers 5,000 perks and discounts just for signing up. Get your free business banking account in just 10 minutes at banknovo.com slash onbrand. Go to banknovo, B-A-N-K-N-O-V-O dot com slash onbrand to sign up for free right now and get a free copy of Novo's Small Business Starter Guide, banknovo.com slash onbrand. It's interesting, your your struggle and your uh, conflict. My mom, I have a wonderful mother. She's 92 years old, a beautiful friend. She lives in Boca Raton. And she was very ahead of her time. For somebody her age, she was a school teacher. She got her master's in guidance and, and, you know, raised kids. There was no help in those days. You know, she did everything herself. And and one of the stories she will always tell, you know, just symbolic, 
that she tells, I don't even remember, that she was getting her master's from St. John's University and she was sitting at the kitchen table and I was like, mom, where's dinner? I was eight or nine or 10 like that. And she said, I'm finishing up, I'm finishing up. And I, she said, and I crossed my arms. And I said, are you a mother first or are you a student and a teacher first? And how that stayed, that's like the story she tells of my childhood and how, right. that, you know, that that was very defining for her. And, and uh, it's such a non-event today. It's so different. It's just, it, it's, it's so... We, the good news, bad news about our world today, and, and you and I are going to talk a lot about politics, and we'll talk about our good friend Donald Trump and some other things, is that we've gone backwards, and we're going backwards in so many ways. I mean, just in terms of what's happening in the Supreme Court, uh, you know, in Texas. But in other ways, whether it, it's uh, uh, being gay in the media today, which just like non, right. non, non-event, you know, just not non- for you— not not event like it's just like not event and and how for somebody like you who who's been so high prof, high, high profile in the community and that how what you know you didn't officially come out for a while and and what it meant to you and what it then you waited till after your talk show how things today that people take for granted and this is a little so bit true. I, I don't know if you like Bill Maher or not but he had a marvelous rant a few weeks ago that it was from an author but he talked about how that. We complain so much about what's wrong, but yet we take for granted. Progressives can't always recognize, you know what? Yes, there's still racial problems today, but, but don't fucking say they're worse than they were 50 years ago. You know what I mean? And, right, and, right. And same thing with being gay and same thing that that us elder folks, me at 63 and you at 60, understand. Like, I didn't, growing up, gay didn't exist in my lexicon. Mine, and, mine either, really. And, and which mine for somebody either. like you must have been so painful where I remember organizing my 25th high school reunion. I was talking to this guy, Richie, and he goes, what are you doing? And he goes, well, I'm going to come in. I'm going to come with my partner. And I want to pause him. And I look back and I thought about him as a 12 year old. Of course he was gay. Like, I, it just didn't, it didn't, it didn't register. It didn't, it wasn't, we saw Liberace. Well, there was a cartoon. Exactly. And, 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 and Elton John and maybe Martina and maybe Billie Jean, but they both denied it. Yeah, Remember yeah. when they were accused of being lesbians and they had press conferences and I was a little girl and I knew that I was gay or I knew that I was different. I knew that I wanted to kiss Lisa Shackner, Lori right. Shackner's sister, not <laughs> Billy Sheeran, right. you know, who was the boy I had a crush on. And right. that sort of he had the most football cards, you know, and whatever baseball cards. But um I don't know. It was it was a time where being gay wasn't even said like it wasn't even really a taunt at school. The that's so gay came much after us, you know, a lot of a lot of years after that. But um, I never thought when I took the job at Warner Brothers, I let them know I was gay before I signed because I wanted them to not invest in me if they weren't sure. I didn't want them to go, oh, she hid this from me. And then it was like a you know, they were paying me a lot of money and I wanted to respect their business sense. And I said, I just want you to know that I'm gay. And it's never really been the hardest thing in my life. My childhood was a lot harder. But um, if, you know, I, I don't imagine I would come out. Now, at the time, Melissa wasn't out. You know, uh, Ellen wasn't out. Yeah. You know, it was it was uh, at the beginning of my show in 96. There weren't very many out celebrities. In fact, they told me there's a new show coming on NBC with a gay guy and a straight girl. I'm like, never going to sell. Never going to sell. They're not going to keep it on the air. I remember that Love, Sydney with Tony Randall where they implied that Impl- his that's lover right. had Jeez, died. I forgot about that. Yeah. Didn't, and they I, took it off the air. I'll, the proudest moment in my career, '93, when I was running my ad agency, we did a commercial for Ikea where we showed two guys shopping for furniture. And it was. And I fir- remember that it was the first time that just in main any mainstream media you just saw, and there was no caricature. There was it was like two guys chopping for furniture, talking about you know their apartment, and it. I remember the thousands of letters I got. Both some, you know, want to skin you, you Jew fag. Somehow they always put Jew fag together. They don't just call you fag, they yeah. don't call you Jew, the Jew fag, you know. Um, right. And then the amazing amount of outpouring of love of people just, thank thank you for just showing us. Like, thank you. And today right. that, that to, stands to, as my- To be invisible. Yeah. To be invisible in a society is a horrible thing. And to have people think less of you because of this- uh, way that you were born, you know, like I always think whenever people flip out about their kid being gay, would you be so mad if he was a lefty? 
Right. You know, like, <laughs> I mean, how are you going to yell at the kid because he <laughs> likes to pick up the pasta with the left hand? Yeah. But you're not. You're going to go, yeah, great what's one. your preference, right? What That's what fits you. And But it's it's so amazing for me to think as a gay woman how far we've come from when we were in high school. Now, I was the captain of all the sports teams. I was the student council president, the homecoming queen, the prom queen. I was an anomaly. Like it, it didn't measure, it didn't match up to what, you know, and, um, gay never came up. Yeah. I got to tell you, even, I had a, I, this is before you came out. Her. I remember when you, when you did sleepless in Seattle, I had like a crush on you. I thought you were like really cute in that movie. You, oh, you, you, you thank just, you. <laughs> That's very th- nice, Donnie. You're the kind of boy I would have liked if I liked boys. <laughs> I'll take that as a huge, huge that's, compliment. That's a huge compliment, exactly. <laughs> I um, let's talk a little. You were one of your great foresights. Is you were one of the first to be on to uh, our former president uh, very early on. You know, it's interesting. I was quote friends with him. He would call me a friend. And friends, if you're in the New York media community, means you knew him. He did my talk show a bunch of times. I did The Apprentice a few seasons. I lived in his building. We go to the same chair. But you know, you never. He doesn't have any real friends. And people would always exactly. ask me, "Did you, what did you know?" And my take is on what most people will say. I said, "Look, I was knew he was an asshole. You know, I, I wouldn't want to go in business with him. I, 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 you know, he, I wouldn't want to be the foxer with him. But there was a, almost you thought a harmlessness to his lounge act, in effect, that it was what he was in on the joke. And as I said, you knew he was a sleazeball, but." You didn't, I didn't see that dark, dark, dark core, but you saw that very early on. Yes, I did. And what? it was to be impossible, I think, for a woman my age who grew up on Long Island with him in the periphery of my life since I have consciousness to remember. I remember his planes getting repossessed off the LaGuardia runway. Yeah. I remember his liquor that failed and it states and he always was just a car salesman to me, a used car salesman. He was a, a bad guy. Like he was as bad as crazy Eddie, yeah. you know, like he just was a caricature that was full of gold lame and nothing else. And everything about him is a lie. And I blame a lot of what has happened to our country on Mark Burnett because he created this monster He made a boardroom at Trump Tower. They didn't have a boardroom. No, they didn't have a boardroom before the show. No, it was a tiny little family. It's a little shithole. What people don't understand, I've been up there a half a dozen times. It's a little shithole with 20 or 30 people that hasn't been redecorated since the late 80s. There's no big. There's no big corporation there. It's a mom and pop licensing business, and that's all it is. Right. It's a logo slapper. Yeah. That's what they do. They slap their logo on people who are willing to buy it. Now, now sadly, in New York, all the buildings that had his num- name on it, they're suing to take down his name, and they succeeded in a bunch of cases. You know, he's so uh, despised, and New Yorkers can understand and see him for what he is in a way that maybe non New Yorkers. Didn't. And but Mark the part Burnett, that, But the part that you saw that I missed, yeah. I saw all the sleazy part. I saw the car salesman's part. I saw the huckster part. I saw, you know, he, 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 you know, he's just full of shit. But the satanic dark core that's there. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. I that, saw it through his, through the beginning with him, how ridiculously sexual he is with his own daughter. Yeah. That was a deep, deep give right there. Yeah. I was like, this is a totally fucked up, boundaryless human well, being. Well, no, that, yes, and, that, yes. It, I'm talking about it, it, 2007. It, I'm talking about before he became a political character. Yeah, you were right. going when back he was to, so, yeah. listen, he would go on Howard Stern and talk about him. If his daughter wasn't his daughter, he'd be fucking her. Yeah. That's what he used to do. And this is not like I'm an investigative journalist and I found this out. Yeah. Anyone living in our culture could find out every single thing you needed to know about him before he ever ran for president. The but po- the mainstream media dropped the ball in the biggest well, way. Well, did they or didn't they? Here's the, here's the thing that I found that I find fascinating and, and sobering that even after all of this and after four years, 40% of people still went, yep, thumbs up, that's what I want. That in a sick way, because all the stuff was out there, him calling you a pig was out there and, and every 19, you know, uh, sexual assaults and everything, grab, grabbing a woman by the, by the vagina, everything was there and every bad deal was there. But they, in a strange way, 
the, the public was so thirsty for the insanity that he was selling and that, you know, it's this, it's this what got Hitler elected, not elected, it's what got Hitler in power is, and I got a lot of trouble on TV for always comparing him to Hitler, and I'm not saying that that there was he was behind Oh, believe me, there are comparisons to be made. Tremendous. By the way, it is yes. the, it's the playbook. It's the playbook. You, right. created, you create an other. You, you say so many lies that nobody even understands what's the truth anymore. You shoot down the and press. And the man had the book. The man had mein the Kampf book next on his desk. nightstand. Yeah. But Come I think, on. I think that the nerve he hit and the reason that people were able to either overlook it or somehow embrace some of these insanities is that if this is my thesis, that if you're unhappy in life, and my theory is that at least 40% of people are, and somebody tells you it's not your fault, it's the brown person's fault, it's the media's fault, it's the Jew's fault, it's the rich person's fault, it's what, you will listen to anything and compensate for anything because it gives you a self-worth that you didn't have. And that was the nerve he hit because you can't explain, you can explain people that had in the sand, but after watching four years of it, four years of it, and, and you know- and But then, four years of it with a fully state-sanctioned propaganda machine, with a lying machine that did what Mark Burnett did, fooled the country into thinking this man had some value or worth, that he was a revered businessman, that he was someone to be looked after and and to have the ability to tell who he had to fire. And, and you know, it was all a caricature that he made up. And, and then the people in the middle of the country believed it. It got higher ratings than the Super Bowl most years, The Apprentice. Right. And um, they believed what, what Mark Burnett packaged and sold, a piece of shit wrapped in gold lame. And Mark Burnett sold that as the most famous businessman in the world. So and the rest of America believed I, it. I got that on round one. Here's what I still don't get as a, as a human with blood running through my veins. I get how he was set up and, he, and a lot of the public got hoodwinked and he was packaged this way and this way. But then we saw four years of it. We saw four years of just despicable humanity. But forget where your politics yes. are, no, but just, just, just the things we grow up, the basic things, telling the truth. Uh, you know, the, the, what, what is the first thing we start with our children before anything else? Say, you can, we'll always forgive something, but you have to tell me the truth. You know what I mean? That's, that's, where you, that's ground zero. That's where, that's where you start. And you, obviously I can go on, on for an hour with his atrocities, but that still after that, almost half this country said, we'll take more. So as somebody who is, has been an uh, observer of culture, part of culture, uh, a behaviorist, a humanist, explain that to me. Break that down for me. Because they said we'll take more because what he did and the atrocities that he did were sugar-coated and blank, blatantly altered by Fox News. But that's still and by only, right, But 3 million people well, are watching Fox News. That's, that's every night. We talk about Fox. At the end of the day— there's 300 million people in this country, and you could really argue it's Facebook, frankly, because that's where half the people get their news. But there was, look, I spent many hundreds and hundreds of hours on television on the other side, on MSNBC. So, I mean, there is there is bespoke news now. I can't blame it on a third-party news because we we choose to get our news where we want now. And that well, the majority- Well, I- I do. I agree with you, and I feel like everybody has niche news now. They pick what they like, but- um, you know, Donald Trump and his atrocities were not focused on, and they still are not. The fact that he has more women accuse him of rape and mm-hmm. abuse and, and sexual abuse, and nothing has been done to him. Nothing. The fact that he arranged and encouraged the January 6th insurrection, and he's still sitting in Palm Springs or wherever the hell he is. I, be- I believe, well, here's what I believe is going to happen, because I, 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 do, I do believe you can't in the galaxy, you can't show up and say, I'm bigger than the house, which is what he did. And you can't show up and say, basically, if you think about it right now, every law enforcement officer every in every you know cubicle right now is hell-bent. And I do believe that what's going to happen with the New York Attorney General and the New York District Attorney, I do believe they're going to take him down. Which, how do they get Al Capone? They didn't get him on murder. Right. They get, and exactly. he's, he's going down. I really believe they're going to take, they're going to RICO the organization. He's going to go down. I don't know if they'll ever get him on January 6th because that's not as, it's a much more dotted line, although obviously it's more heinous than anything he did. I do believe he and his family will be taken apart. I, I, I genuinely believe that. I don't know if I'm uh, 
an optimist. I believe it too, Donnie, and but, I have to believe it because I'm an American. I, I am and too. I believe in justice. But the and I believe that 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 he will be held accountable because and, he did incite the entire thing. His and his, but did you see the excerpts from the new CNN book? Uh, I mean, the new, yes. uh, the new uh, Woodward. Holy shit! Woodward book, yes, holy unbelievable. Shit. But the, I knew that was true by his behavior yeah. in public. Oh, so I he, said. Oh, by the way, I said a year and a half. Michael Cohn and I said this, and I know Michael Cohn. You, you, you developed a relationship. He's a friend of mine. He and I were the first ones to say because he knew him well, and I knew him fairly well. He's not leaving office. He's not. You, trust right. me. I remember saying to Chris, uh, uh, not Chris Wallace. Um, Oh my God, I'm having Chris a senior, senior moment. Not Chris Cuomo, Chris Matthews. Um, <laughs> you know, I do this every day, Johnny. I, I, I'm I the, the same thing. Isn't that amazing? I'm like, that girl, what da, da, show da, da, was da, she da, on? Yeah. What show? Saying that there's, he's going to call for bloodshed on the streets. Um, he is yes. going to, uh, it, was, it was so clear. If you knew that guy and you understood him, it was so clear. And like any autocrat, he tells you along the way. He was telling you what yes. he was doing. But my, my million dollar question still, and the thing that keeps me up at night, and this is why- how much is Trump and how much is he just more of a reflection is that it's one thing to, for him to fake everybody out, but a chunk of this country said, yes, we like that. To, to racism. That's what it, that's what it is. That you nailed it. They that's said it. yes to racism. That's and what that's what Donald Trump is all about. That's it. That's if see, there's anyone he can belittle or humiliate any group, any faction, women, heavy women, gay women, any women, children, his own daughter, his ex-wife who he was accused of raping. He is really a despicable, horridly corrupt person. His soul is missing. And I think he is severely mentally ill and a danger to the United he's States. He's a sociopath. He's a clear, by the way, you look up sociopath in dictionary, nine of the 11 traits are just like he's poster boy for. How do you feel about, yes. our, current, how do you feel about our current president? What's your take on Biden? I'm happy that he got in there. At first, I was not very happy that he was running. I thought he was too old. And I really was hoping that Elizabeth Warren was going to ride that little bump she had mm. in the middle all the way down. But, you know, I stand behind President Biden and this horrible attempt by the Republican Party to dismantle democracy in front of our very eyes. And um, I hope that the Democratic Party gets really fired up like the right wing does to do what we did last night here in California, where we said no to the ridiculous recall of Gavin Newsom. And everybody was worried and thinking, oh, well, you know, Trump, he's got a lot of them. Marin County. You better watch out. Or, yeah. you know, Orange County, that's all Trump County. No, no, no. The voters and the people with clear eyes and open hearts said, no, we will not take more of this Trump insanity. And that's what happened here by a big margin. And I'm hoping that's going to continue. You know, Donnie, it's really funny. I'm renting this house in Beverly Hills in the flats. And aren't you my fancy? Door- aren't you fancy, Rosie O'Donnell from Comac, Long Island? Yeah, but it's not it's not like the, you think of Beverly Hills. But anyway, <laughs> I, okay. So I'm in it. It's very nice. Right. And next you should, neighbor, you, should have, four, you should have a nice house. <laughs> I do. I have a nice right. house. No, but uh she has four little kids under the age of seven, four girls, and my daughter is eight, and she is just so happy. And they're playing and they're getting along the first few days we move in here. And then the parents invite us over and I see their MAGA hats hanging on their liquor cabinet. It changes, changes and everything. And I had to leave. I had to leave the house. Right? Changes everything. I was like, I went home and I was like, what am I going to do? My daughter's in love with the three, the four girls and the family is really nice and kind. So the next time I saw the mother, she says, why haven't I seen you around anywhere? You know, and I said, truthfully, it's your MAGA hats. Yeah. And it's, it feels like I'm a Jew and I just saw a swastika in your house. You know, it, I can't do it. I, I can't do it. I'm the same way. I want to shift this right. a little bit life lighter. We'll come back to this only because you brought up the MAGA hat and I thought about the Larry David episode. And one of my <laughs> favorite things you've ever done, it, 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 one of the best pieces of comedy ever in any idiom was when you and Larry were going after the same girl and you caught him juicing. And 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 give me the backstory and how that even came about. And I, I, I like you, think the man is a genius. Uh, I just, he is. But give me about right. the beginning of how you got together with Larry on that. Well, um, I had done the, a couple episodes before and, and he, and I think that was, I'm not sure, but he, he, I was familiar with how he worked and we got into this bar. You know nothing. You don't have a script. No, no. Right? And they he, give you a paragraph. Right, they describe the scene in, and that's it. You show yeah. up right? You get your own clothes. You walk in as you. And um, he said, okay, 
I got this girl's phone number at this bar. You got the girl's number. And then we meet at the bar. All right. So like uh, you, you and me and we'll just talk. I said, OK. So we did the first take. And then he goes, OK, good. Now let's do it again. and Let's drop out the middle part. Let's drop out this and let's add that. We added that. We did it again. We did it again. We did it again. And, you know, I love working with him because you can go anywhere and you will not stump him. Yeah. No matter what you say, he has a retort and it's, you know, fits in the scene and fits in his character. And I mean, those are some of the most fun days working in show business when you get to work with Larry David and get to do improvisational comedy on such a respected and revered show. You know, Um, he's he's one of the one of the great ones, Larry David. And he really is. And I've just met Larry a couple of times casually. And but what I found out from Susie that is was so kind of um, heartening is, yes, there's a little bit of that character, but how revered he is by his crew and how loyal he is and, and how people just, you know, the affection that they have for him. And it's just, it's, it's, the character is in there. He has those thoughts, yes. but it's just not who he is at his core at the same oh, point. Oh, no, yeah. and to be able to mine your own neuroses to find yeah. the art and the comedy in it. I mean, he did that for Seinfeld. You know, Seinfeld was on the show Benson and he was such a bad actor. I didn't like, know that. I don't even, Are you kidding me? He, no, I'm not kidding Holy you. He shit. was on that, and he was so bad that NBC took him off of it. And then Larry David was going to write a comedy for him based on his act. And all of a sudden, Jerry Seinfeld could act because he was doing his own thing. Yeah. Thinking, hey, dogs don't have pockets. Uh- <laughs> I'm saying, hey, you know. <laughs> He's doing that, and uh, to the to the benefit of the of the world and the culture. That show was was another epic show, Seinfeld. Um, but it was Larry David's genius that yes. was able to pull that out of Jerry. You know? yeah. Speaking of genius, you got some serious acting chops that have been on display lately and been getting a lot of great views. Uh, Thank you with, so much, with, Donnie. With that Mark Ruffalo and Smilf and, and, I mean, really, really juicy stuff. You talked earlier in your life that you wanted to get to the be the Geraldine Page and start to play these wonderful characters. Exactly. And, and you're kind of living your dream right now. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I always thought when I got to be an older actress like Geraldine Page or Colleen Dewhurst, you know, because I'm not going to have any surgery, I'm going to age as you look I great age. By, you look great, by the way. You really oh, do. Oh, thank you. Don't I'm going to be 60. I'm just like, you know, Six, 60's I can't believe the new 60. I'm, 60 is the new 60. Yeah, 60, yeah. I don't mind. But my, to think my mother didn't make 40 and I'm hitting 60 is kind of a little bit trippy still, you know, you yeah. think that would go away. It's been like 50 years since she died. No, that which, has uh, been, been a clear, uh, clearly a defining, defining, uh, a defining thing moment for you. without a doubt. What yes, does that mean? I want to just, just, just dive into that for a second. When we're, that's obvious how, not obvious. It, it, one can only imagine how losing your mom at 11, but how has that influenced you? You've obviously probably like all of us done some work, a lot of work on yourself and, and thought about things and reflected on things and dove into things. So what, how did that go into making this do? So now if you look back at it as a 60 year old evolved woman with five children with a lot of success and a lot of chapters to your life, a lot of romances and you go, ah, okay. I see that that caused ABCDE. Well, her dying caused me to be successful before I was 40. I would tell everyone when I was in high school, oh, I'm going to be an entertainer, but I'm going to quit when I'm 40. Like, I I kind of have this very good ability to manifest what I think. And I don't know necessarily how I have it, but I definitely have it. And, you know, I remember leaving my show. Everyone was like, you're going to regret this. You're going to, I'm like, I I have five children. You know, yeah. uh, I don't only have this. I have other things, too, that I'm growing and I, they need care and my attention and my time. And, um, you know, but my mother's death propelled me to start stand up at 15 and do it in all the local clubs and do it when my friends could cut out of school, uh, you know, or go in late the next day to watch me when I got my like 12 midnight spot. At the so so you see, your, your mom died 11 was like, Oh, I don't have the 85 year window. that exactly. everybody else does. Right. I right. thought this could be over like that. So yeah. you'd better do what you want to do, you know? And I wanted to get enough money that I could adopt and never have to worry about money. So once I had, you know, money from doing the movies and doing Broadway, I was like, well, now I'm going to adopt a baby. And that was the plan all along, too. And uh, I always wanted to have eight kids. I have five. I think five is more than enough. <laughs> five is a good number. Five is a, five is a very ro- a robust, number. healthy number. 
So and I'm one of five, so it felt familiar to me to have a five kid family. You know, you know? I as speaking of one of five, I interviewed once or interviewed for a job. I can't remember. I think I was interviewing to maybe hire him. one of your brothers who's in media. Eddie. Eddie. Yes. I remember yes. I interviewed Eddie O'Donnell and um, somehow it came up in the conversation. It was just a little small sidebar. And I have another brother who's a politician there in New York. He's, and, he's, um, a, a state assembly or? Uh, yes. Yeah, state right. assembly. Okay. Yes. Danny, my brother, Danny. And uh, he's doing a lot for abortion rights now, trying to make sure that that horrible Texas uh, law that other states are adapting and trying to adapt. Is, is it fucking amazing? It was a little bit it's of the dichotomy I was talking about before. In certain ways, we're moving forward. You just, you can't fucking believe it. Here, here's my question. These politicians, do they go, they have loved ones, obviously. They have daughters and wives and, 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 and. Yeah. Do they, I always wonder, do these guys think they're the bad guys? Do they, because by the way, you can be pro-life, you can be pro-choice, but. The concept of not allowing a woman a few weeks later, if she's been raped by her uncle, to uh, to abort is there's no there's no other human to decide of it. You know what I mean? You you can it's, have an, it's, inhumane. it's yeah, inhumane. Yeah, there's, there's no there's a there's a human discussion when you have an intelligent pro life pro choice discussion where with a religious person where you go. I mean, for you and I, there's no choice. There's no discussion, but. There is a logical, okay, I this is what I believe in this, but this new going where we're going now and then deputizing other citizens to to become a Gestapo and find these people. Exactly. What the fuck? What the fuck? What the fuck is right, Donnie? It's absolutely absurd. And I remember 1973, Roe versus Wade. That was the year after my mother died. I remember what was going on in the country and I remember the stories of women with hangers and, uh, you know, still the ERA is not ratified. I mean, this country has a lot of issues that it needs to address. And, you know, one of them is, is the equality of, of every member of this nation. And we're half the members. We need to have our name put in the Constitution. And, you know, it's it's horrible how they're they're trying to, the Republican Party is trying to go back to some idyllic version of the 50s that never was. Yeah. And Here's I, the, for one, don't want to go back. Let me give you the political good news from my perspective, is that I think this this is going to be a club for the Democrat. I think that issue trumps, no pun intended, just about every other issue, other than someone's pocketbook at that moment for certain people. And I think that you can, if I'm creating a Democratic campaign now for a candidate or for the DNC, is- you know, I package that together with their support or, or their lack of ability to look into the inter- insurrection, to not wanting to keep children safe in schools. It, it's the party of don't. It's the party of backwards. There's not one issue they're putting forward that is a issue for the people. Everything is just a let's move backwards or let's stop or let's not. And I think starting with this one issue I do think in a weird way it gives the Democrats a a bit more of a club to work with in the midterms and, and might end up blowing up in the Republicans' face. Yeah, and I hope it does because like 80-something percent of people believe in uh, – it was high 70s – believe in safe and legal abortions. And it's already yeah. precedent decided by the Supreme Court. And what they're doing is a dereliction of du- duty. And it's why when Trump is eventually arrested and – and held responsible for January 6th. Every action that he took as president should be negated. All of those Supreme Court justices, I'm sorry, but he was an uh, unofficial president and he was, um, you know, a danger to this country. And and his, what he did to the Supreme Court, we can't let that stand. We have to fill, fill fill the benches. We have to increase the number of jurors on the Supreme Court. We'll say, well, I, I'm for that. We'll see what's going to happen with that. I, you know, you just spurned a Donnie Deutsch, Rosie O'Donnell, Donald Trump moment that I remember that I completely forgotten. I don't know it popped into my head. I was interviewed, this is long before his president, this is probably 2006, 2007, or 2008, somewhere around there. And I was interviewing him on my, I used to have a talk show on, night, nightly talk show on CNBC. And I was interviewing him and I said, I got to tell you, I have real issues with, you know, you calling Rosie these names. You know, you can not like somebody or disagree, but there's just basic human decency. And I remember he turned to me, and this this is in early telling him, the and he said to me, I thought you were my friend. I said, well, yeah. I, 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 what, does, does that mean if you go kill somebody, yeah. I'm supposed to go, hey, dude. That, like you said, 
he could kill someone on Fifth Avenue and get away but with it. But that was his blind sense of just somebody debating and just say, look, I, it, there's no room for that. You know, I mean, you it, it's yeah, just, yeah. it's just, there's right, there's wrong, there's human, there's decency. But there's, he, you know, not only does he like to do it, he revels in it. Like he, this is the highlight of his day to yeah. talk about. I saw him talking about after when he said, you know, Megan Kelly said, you've called women pigs and dogs and gross and disgusting. And he said, no, only Rosie O'Donnell. Yeah. No, and the audience a f- laughed. Famous line. Famous line. Yeah. yeah. And then the next day I heard him with a bunch of reporters retelling. And I said, it was got the best laugh of the night. Yeah. Got the best laugh. Yeah. Got applause. You know, yeah. he was so excited to like a, a, a really bad stand up comic who, you know, hits with one dick joke and he thinks that he's the next, you know, Richard Pryor. I don't know. Um, he he enjoyed his cruelty as he did taking children away from their parents at the border. Yeah. He enjoys cruelty. That's what's really sick about him. He feels that he can grab any woman by the pussy. He feels that he can rape any woman that he wants. He feels that he's above the law, that he can set irrational people to take over the Capitol and direct them which street to go down. And not have to be held accountable. I mean, what is he made of that we can't hold him accountable? Oh, that's you know, change. when I first made fun of him, Joy Joy Behar said to me when I made fun of him that day about what he when he gave the Junior Miss America uh, a second chance because she had been caught kissing a girl down in the village. Right. And um, Joy Behar, I said in the green room what I was going to say. I go, I'm probably going to just tell him off because who does he think he is? This girl's 18 years old. If she wants to kiss another girl, she should be left alone. He doesn't own her. This right. is what I was saying. And Joy's like, but you can't say that, can you? I said, why not? She's like, well, wouldn't you be afraid? And I said to her, dead seriously, afraid of what? Afraid of what? What's Donald Trump going to do to me? Well, what he did to me was what he did for 10 years after. Yeah. Right. What he's still doing. Now, That's because major, I told the truth about it's made it. you here. It's enhanced your brand. You brought the view. As you look back now, a bunch of years, and yeah. you had a couple of stints there. Give me yeah. Rosie's. Give me Rosie's quick uh, overview. And oh, here, here's what I kind of think about the view. You know, I try not to watch it now because it upsets me. I think that there are there's so much better of a show to be had yeah. than the one that they're producing, and I think that it's gotten really lazy and. Um, kind of scripted and you know it doesn't have that wonderful live feeling that the view had in the old days of elizabeth hasselbeck and joy and you know everybody uh i i don't know i I tell you this i wasn't a good fit the second time Whoopi does not enjoy me no i did not enjoy me i was i was interested to read that that i I would have assumed you and Whoopi very much from the same cloth and it just yes and my whole career always admired her always have reverence for her you know, I, I respect that there are so few black women given an opportunity to do the things that, you know, she does and uh, she does them well. And I have admiration for her, but she was unkind to me. It was painful and um, unexpected. And, uh, you know, but it's water under the bridge. You don't walk around worrying when yeah. that would be Goldberg doesn't like me now. But, you know, some people say to me, well, what happened on that show? I'm like, watch the tape. Go to YouTube. Well, you, you one you tell the story, which I can't. Celebrities sometimes baffle me that you you there was a cue to it was a cut to a commercial and she wasn't picking up on it. And you jumped in and I, and I've done yeah. that on shows. I mean, where you of just course, see so you, right. like that, and then somebody goes, "Thank you," and that actually became an issue. I, I just right. Kind she of blew said, me away. "You know what are you doing?" And I said, "Oh, they were rapping." And I just thought I I didn't think you saw him. He was behind you rapping. Right. And she just you know stared at me and she said. Uh, I know when to rap Rosie, you know, I was like, mm, boy, you know, I feel like the view is five players. It's like a basketball team. True, right? Somebody takes the court, the ball down the court. Somebody goes underneath. You try to pass, you get it up. It's a team effort. You know, that's, that's my view of doing the view and it's not at all what it ended up being, yeah. but you know, yeah, my friend, listen, Nicole, God's my speed, friend Nicole people Wallace, watch them. Yeah. My friend, Nicole, Wallace, who I know you're friendly with also just, She's such a polite person. You can't really get it out of her about what a painful yeah, time yeah. that was on the view, because she'll never have a yeah. bad word said about anybody. But like, I know for her, it was it was a tough, tough, tough experience. Also, you know, she, yeah, it definitely was. You know, she called me when Harvey Weinstein was found guilty and apologized 
to me for saying there was no way to know the truth or something. And she called me and texted me and said, you know, Harvey Weinstein is uh, found guilty today and I owe you an apology. Uh, yeah, that's Nicole. That's yeah, Nicole. She's class good. Ass, she, she is, she's, you know, everybody asks me, is she as nice as she seems? And she is. She really, really is. You, yeah, she's taken over that afternoon spot. She's just great. That. She's she's. I do that show once a week, and she's just. She has this unique ability to be on the one hand, like the smartest person in the room, and so inside, but yet is just talking to you and relating to you as the as somebody having a cup of coffee next door. And and it's yeah, a, she has a found the perfect fit for her talent in yeah. that spot. Yeah, and and I you know love when she and Brian she softens Brian for me. I, yeah. Sometimes have a Brian Williams aversion. I love him. I just, uh, I, because he's in on the joke. The thing about Brian that I love, he's Mr. Anchorman. And, you know, like actually, you, he's cast out of central casting and he's easier. But I guess maybe I know him personally. He's just, he's playing an anchorman. Like it's just, he's just, he's, and I think he's, I know, he's but a, it's so ridiculous by the time he gets through the introductions. Coming up next, a Pulitzer Prize winner, a man who has done more than most men have ever done doing what this man did, Phil Rucker. And up next, sitting next to him, is a talented actress and a wonderful Claire. She, he doesn't shut up. Right. Like Brian Williams, you could say, Phil, we watch the show. We know who you're talking right. to. Right, right. The same. That's you very know, funny. He does too much anchor man for me. So what have you, we're talking about various celebrities and whatnot. You you had a front row seat for so many years and, and you know, you've talked about a lot of this individuals that have been on the sadness of seeing Farrah Fawcett with cocaine on her nose and different things. You know, yeah, it was so it, sad. Yeah. Is there anything you've kind of blanket statement you learned? Okay, after sitting and interviewing and meeting 5,000 of the biggest celebrities in the world, here's my take. And obviously, it's it's such a generalized question, but um, any, th- any kind of just lessons learned? Okay, famous people. Here's where I put well, you to me, you Yeah, that's interesting. That the, the big thing to me, I wanted to make sure that as interesting a conversation as I had on camera, I wanted to have during the commercial. Yeah. Because I would go on Letterman's show and he would not talk to you. Which is really normal. Yeah. I mean, very, very normal. And it was very intimidating, very weird. And, you know, I'd be sitting there and then Bill Sheff, my friend from the stand up days, would come up and sit next to me. I'm like, is it even going well? He's like, yes, you're killing it. Don't worry. And, you know, but uh, right, yeah. he was such a strange character. But for me, I wanted to treat them as real people. I would meet them before they went into this set. I would tell them any uh, any things you don't want to talk about, you know, because we will leave it alone. Yeah. And they're like, no, nope, I'm good. And I wanted to them to fe- feel comfortable and safe and, and sort of uh, in a good place for that hour that they didn't have to worry. Now, of course, Tom Selleck had to worry, but yes. uh, that's another story. <laughs> but, uh, just... Every every other celebrity had a pretty safe landing there at the Rosie O'Donnell show. When your Selleck interview, which obviously he came on as a very close after Columbine, which had a tr- tr- phenomenal effect on you as it did most of us. And he's a big NRI guy. And were you ahead of time saying, okay, we're going to go at it or it just, it just kind of happened. No, I, we ahead of time told his publicist that we were going to do one thing on the movie, and then we were going to do one thing about the NRA. And they said, okay, and they knew it. So I just don't think they knew how you know ferocious I would be or ferocious or however people interpreted that. But you know, he had just come out with an ad two weeks after Columbine that said, shooting teaches children good values, the NRA. Imagine. And I said, you put your name on this. This is signed by you, Tom Selleck. Is that your quote? Do you believe that shooting teaches children good values? And and, and so it, it began. And, uh, you know, in the end, you know, uh, I don't think either of us moved any closer uh, to a position, although he's no longer represented representing the NRA now. But I don't think that's because of what I did 25 years ago. Yeah. yeah. Any regrets? Um. Some with romance, you know, some yeah, you, with, you and, me, um, you and me both. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's a hard thing to figure, but, um, you know, my regrets, you know, are, are about maybe, you know, right now in the O'Donnell family, it's three against two and it feels bad, you know, but if you have parents, the parents will come in and say, Hey, you're all coming to Thanksgiving. Shut up. 
Right. Right. You show up and you be nice for one day. Is that so much to ask? Right. Right. So we don't have parents. So it's very hard. So for a while, it's been three against two. You're talking about your original nuclear family. My siblings. My siblings. siblings. Why is that? Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Why is that? Yeah. You know, we had a lot of trauma in our house as kids and some are willing to talk about it and some are not. And, you know, some are much more private and they don't appreciate any publicity about anything because it infers them as well. And you know, and some just, you know, uh, it's three against two. I'm on the three side, you know, <laughs> I'm hoping we can be a, one, a five together one, one day soon. Rosie, you're a doll. I really, I really, really appreciate you. And as I said, I've just watched you over the years. We've, we've just casually met a couple of times, but I've just always so admired your, your brains, your moxie, your self-awareness and your, uh, fun ability to reinvent yourself and how you very early on, before it was very vogue to be a liberal voice, and uh, we're one of the early ones in there punching away, and and I applaud you for that. Thank you, Donnie, so much. And it, the respect is mutual because I I listen to you when you're on anytime, and I uh, love your perspective and how you think of things as as brands. It's an interesting uh, way to to compartmentalize your life, and I've always found it fascinating. So. I'm, I'm happy to have this chance to talk with you today. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Stay well. And I wish everything well, well to your kids. Okay. All right. Thank you, honey. Hey guys, I hope you enjoy, enjoyed this episode of On Brand and my interview with Rosie O'Donnell. Remember to rate, subscribe, and review anywhere you get podcasts, Spotify, Apple, anyplace else. And also please subscribe and go to YouTube and you can see our videos and remember to review them. Uh, and subscribe and rate and do all those wonderful things. Uh, Also leave a comment, uh, any comments you have. We love your comments and any brands you want us to review. And uh, we'll see you next time on On Brand. Hey, everybody, thanks for watching. If you like it, hit that subscribe button. And we love having you here watching On Brand. And just don't miss any future episodes. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We'll see you next time.